Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy Definitions Definition 1. The quantity of matter is the measure of the same, arising from its density and bulk conjointly. Thus, air of a double density in a double space is quadruple in quantity, in a triple space, sextuple in quantity. The same thing is to be understood of snow and fine dust or powders that are condensed by compression or liquefaction, and of all bodies that are by any causes whatever differently condensed. I have no regard in this place to a medium, if any such there is, that freely pervades the interstices between the parts of bodies. It is this quantity that I mean hereafter everywhere under the name of body or mass. And the same is known by the weight of each body, for it is proportional to the weight, as I have found by experiments on pendulums, very accurately made, which shall be shown hereafter. Definition 2. The quantity of motion is the measure of the same, arising from the velocity and quantity of matter conjointly. The motion of the whole is the sum of the motions of all the parts, and therefore, in a body double in quantity, with equal velocity, the motion is double. With twice the velocity, it is quadruple. Definition 3. The vis in ceta, or innate force of matter, is a power of resisting, by which every body as much as in it lies, continues in its present state, whether it be of rest or of moving uniformly forwards in a right line. This force is always proportional to the body whose force it is and differs nothing from the inactivity of the mass, but in our manner of conceiving it. A body from the inert nature of matter is not without difficulty put out of its state of rest or motion Upon which account, this vis in ceta may, by a most significant name, be called inertia, or force of inactivity. But a body only exerts this force when another force impressed upon it endeavours to change its condition, and the exercise of this force may be considered as both resistance and impulse. It is resistance so far as the body for maintaining its present state, opposes the force impressed. It is impulse so far as the body, by not easily giving way to the impressed force of another, endeavours to change the state of that other. Resistance is usually ascribed to bodies at rest, and impulse to those in motion, but motion and rest, as commonly conceived, are only relatively distinguished. Nor are those bodies always truly at rest, which commonly are taken to be so. Definition 4. An impressed force is an action exerted upon a body in order to change its state, either of rest or of uniform motion in a right line. This force consists in the action only and remains no longer in the body when the action is over. For a body maintains every new state it acquires by its inertia only. But impressed forces are of different origins, as from percussion, from pressure, from centripetal force. Definition 5. A centripetal force is that by which bodies are drawn or impelled, or any way tend, towards a point as to a centre. Of this sort is gravity, by which bodies tend to the centre of the earth, Magnetism, by which iron tends to the lodestone, and that force, whatever it is, by which the planets are continually drawn aside from the rectilinear motions which otherwise they would pursue, and made to revolve in curvilinear orbits. A stone, whirled about in a sling, endeavours to recede from the hand that turns it, 
and by that endeavour distends the sling, and that with so much the greater force as it is revolved with the greater velocity, and as soon as it is let go, flies away. That force which opposes itself to this endeavour, and by which the sling continually draws back the stone towards the hand and retains it in its orbit, because it is directed to the hand as the centre of orbit, I call the centripetal force. And the same thing is to be understood of all bodies, revolved in any orbits. They all endeavour to recede from the centres of their orbits, and were it not for the opposition of a contrary force which restrains them to and detains them in their orbits, which I therefore call centripetal, would fly off in right lines with a uniform motion. A projectile, if it was not for the force of gravity, would not deviate towards the earth, but would go off from it in a right line, and that with a uniform motion, if the resistance of the air was taken away. It is by its gravity that it is drawn aside continually from its rectilinear course and made to deviate towards the earth, more or less according to the force of its gravity and the velocity of its motion. The less its gravity is, or the quantity of its matter, or the greater the velocity with which it is projected, the less it will deviate from a rectilinear course and the farther it will go. If a leaden ball projected from the top of a mountain by the force of gunpowder, with a given velocity and in a direction parallel to the horizon, is carried in a curved line to the distance of two miles before it falls to the ground. The same if the resistance of air were taken away, with a double or decuple velocity would fly twice or ten times as far. And by increasing the velocity, we may at pleasure increase the distance to which it might be projected and diminish the curvature of the line which it might describe, till at last it should fall at the distance of 10, 30 or 90 degrees, or even might go quite around the whole earth before it falls. Or lastly, so that it might never fall to the earth, but go forwards into the celestial spaces and proceed in its motion in infinitum. And after the same manner that a projectile, by the force of gravity, may be made to revolve in an orbit and go round the whole earth, the moon also, either by the force of gravity, if it is endued with gravity, or by any other force that impels it towards the earth, may be continually drawn aside towards the earth, out of the rectilinear way which by its innate force it would pursue, and would be made to revolve in the orbit which it now describes. Nor could the moon without some such force be retained in its orbit. If this force was too small, it would not sufficiently turn the moon out of a rectilinear course. If it was too great, it would turn it too much and draw down the moon from its orbit towards the earth. It is necessary that the force be of a just quantity and it belongs to the mathematicians to find the force that may serve exactly to retain a body in a given orbit with a given velocity, and vice versa, to determine the curvy linear way into which a body projected from a given place with a given velocity may be made to deviate from its natural rectilinear way by means of a given force. The quantity of any centripetal force may be considered as of three kinds, absolute, accelerative, and motive. Definition six. The absolute quantity of a centripetal force is the measure of the same, proportional to the efficacy of the cause that propagates it from the center through the spaces round about. Thus, the magnetic force is greater in one lodestone and less in another, according to their sizes and strength of intensity. Definition 7. The accelerative quantity of a centripetal force 
is the measure of the same, proportional to the velocity which it generates in a given time. Thus, the force of the same lodestone is greater at a less distance and less at a greater. Also, the force of gravity is greater in valleys, less on tops of exceeding high mountains, and yet less, as shall hereafter be shown, at greater distances from the body of the earth. But at equal distances, it is the same everywhere, because taking away or allowing for the resistance of the air, it equally accelerates all falling bodies, whether heavy or light, great or small. Definition eight. The motive quantity of a centripetal force is the measure of the same, proportional to the motion which it generates in a given time. Thus, the weight is greater in a greater body less in a less body, and in the same body it is greater near to the earth and less at remoter distances. This sort of quantity is the centripetency or propension of the whole body towards the centre, or as I may say, its weight, and it is always known by the quantity of an equal and contrary force just sufficient to hinder the descent of the body. These quantities of forces we may, for the sake of brevity, call by the names of motive, accelerative and absolute forces, and for the sake of distinction, consider them with respect to the bodies that tend to the centre, to the places of those bodies, and to the centre of force towards which they tend. That is to say, I refer the motive force to the body as an endeavour and propensity of the whole towards a centre, arising from the propensities of the several parts taken together. The accelerative force to the place of the body as a certain power diffused from the centre to all places around to move the bodies that are in them, and the absolute force to the centre as endued with some cause without which these motive forces would not be propagated through the spaces round about. Whether that cause be some central body, such as is the magnet in the centre of the magnetic force, or the earth in the centre of the gravitating force, or anything else that does not yet appear. For I here design only to give a mathematical notion of these forces, without considering their physical causes and seats. Wherefore, the accelerative force will stand in the same relation to the motive as celerity does to motion. For the quantity of motion arises from the celerity multiplied by the quantity of matter, and the motive force arises from the accelerative force multiplied by the same quantity of matter. For the sum of the actions of the accelerative force upon the several particles of the body, it is the motive force of the whole. Hence it is that near the surface of the earth, where the accelerative gravity or force producive of gravity in all bodies is the same. The motive gravity of the weight is as the body. But if we should ascend to higher regions where the accelerative gravity is less, the weight would be equally diminished and would always be as the product of the body by the accelerative gravity. So in those regions where the accelerative gravity is diminished into one half, the weight of a body two or three times less will be four or six times less. I likewise call attractions and impulses, in the same sense, accelerative and motive, and use the words attraction, impulse or propensity of any sort towards a centre, promiscuously and indifferently, one for another, considering those forces not physically but mathematically, wherefore the reader is not to imagine that by those words I anywhere take upon me 
to define the kind or the manner of any action, the causes or the physical reasons thereof, or that I attribute forces in a true and physical sense to certain centers, which are only mathematical points. When at any time I happen to speak of centers as attracting or as endued with attractive powers. Scolium. Hitherto I have laid down the definitions of such words as are less known, and explained the sense in which I would have them to be understood in the following discourse. I do not define time, space, place, and motion as being well known to all. Only I must observe that the common people conceive those quantities under no other notions but from the relation they bear to sensible objects, and thence arise certain prejudices for the removing of which it will be convenient to distinguish them into absolute and relative, true and apparent, mathematical and common. 1. Absolute true and mathematical time, of itself and from its own nature, flows equally without relation to anything external, and by another name is called duration. Relative, apparent and common time is some sensible and external, whether accurate or unequable, measure of duration by the means of motion, which is commonly used instead of true time, such as hour, a day, a month, a year. 2. Absolute space, in its own nature, without relation to anything external, remains always similar and immovable. Relative space is some movable dimension or measure of the absolute spaces, which our senses determine by its position to bodies, and which is commonly taken for a movable space. Such is the dimension of a subterraneous, an aerial or celestial space, determined by its position in respect of the earth. Absolute and relative space are the same in figure and magnitude, but they do not remain always numerically the same. For if the earth, for instance, moves a space of our air, which relatively and in respect of the earth remains always the same, will at one time be part of the absolute space into which the air passes. At another time, it will be another part of the same. And so, absolutely understood, it will be continually changed. 3. Place is a part of space which a body takes up and is according to the space, either absolute or relative. I say a part of space, not the situation, nor the external surface of the body. For the places of equal solids are always equal, but their surfaces, by reason of their dissimilar figures, are often unequal. Positions properly have no quantity, nor are they so much the places themselves as the properties of places. The motion of the whole is the same with the sum of the motions of the parts, that is, the translation of the whole out of its place is the same thing with the sum of the translations of the parts out of their places. Absolute time in astronomy is distinguished from relative by the equation or correction of the apparent time, for the natural days are truly unequal, though they are commonly considered as equal and used for a measure of time. Astronomers correct this inequality so that they may measure the celestial motions by a more accurate time. It may be that there is no such thing as an equable motion, whereby time may be accurately measured. All motions may be accelerated and retarded, but the flowing of absolute time is not liable to any change. The duration or perseverance of the existence of all things remains the same, whether the motions are swift or slow or none at all, 
and therefore this duration ought to be distinguished from what are only sensible measures thereof, and from which we deduce it by means of the astronomical equation. The necessity of this equation for determining the times of a phenomenon is evidenced as well from the experiments of the pendulum clock as by eclipses of the satellites of Jupiter. As the order of the sum of parts is immutable, so also is the order of the parts of space. Suppose those parts to be moved out of their places and they will be moved, if the expression may be allowed, out of themselves. For times and spaces are, as it were, the places as well of themselves as of all other things. All things are placed in time as to order of succession and in space as to order of situation. It is from their essence or nature that they are places and that the primary places of things should be movable is absurd. These are therefore the absolute places and translations out of those places are the only absolute motions. But because the parts of space cannot be seen or distinguished from one another by our senses, therefore in their stead we use sensible measures of them. For from the positions and distances of things from any body considered as immovable, we define all places, and then with respect to such places, we estimate all motions, considering bodies as transferred from one of those places into others. And so, instead of absolute places and motions, we use relative ones, and that without any inconvenience in common affairs, but in philosophical disquisitions, we ought to abstract from our senses, and consider things themselves, distinct from what are only sensible measures of them. For it may be that there is no body really at rest, to which the places and motions of others may be referred. But we may distinguish rest and motion, absolute and relative, one from the other, by their properties, causes and effects. It is a property of rest that bodies really at rest do rest in respect to one another. And therefore, as it is possible, that in the remote regions of the fixed stars, or perhaps far beyond them, there may be some body absolutely at rest, but impossible to know, from the position of bodies to one another in our regions, whether any of these do keep the same position to that remote body. It follows that absolute rest cannot be determined from the position of bodies in our regions. It is a property of motion that the parts which retain given positions to their holes do partake of the motions of those holes. For all the parts of revolving bodies endeavour to recede from the axis of motion, and the impetus of bodies moving forwards arises from the joint impetus of all the parts. Therefore, if surrounding bodies are moved, those that are relatively at rest within them will partake of their motion, upon which account the true and absolute motion of a body cannot be determined by the translation of it from those which only seem to rest, for the external bodies ought not only to appear at rest, but to be really at rest. For otherwise, all included bodies, besides their translations from near the surrounding ones, partake likewise of their true motions. And though that translation were not made, they would not be really at rest, but only seem to be so. For the surrounding bodies stand in the like relation to the surrounded as the exterior part of a whole does to the interior, or as the shell does to the kernel. But if the shell moves, the kernel will also move, as being part of the whole, without any removal from near the shell. A property near akin to the preceding is this, that if a place is moved, whatever is placed therein moves along with it. And therefore a body which is moved from a place in motion 
partakes also of the motion of its place, upon which account all motions from places in motion are no other than parts of entire and absolute motions, and every entire motion is composed of the motion of the body out of its first place, and the motion of this place out of its place, and so on, until we come to some immovable place, wherefore entire and absolute motions can be no otherwise determined than by immovable places, and for that reason I did before refer those absolute motions to immovable places, but relative ones to movable places. Now no other places are immovable, but those that, from infinity to infinity, do all retain the same given position, one to another, and upon this account must ever remain unmoved, and do thereby constitute immovable space. The causes by which true and relative motions are distinguished, one from the other, are the forces impressed upon bodies to generate motion. True motion is neither generated nor altered, but by some force impressed upon the body moved, but relative motion may be generated or altered without any force impressed upon the body, for it is sufficient only to impress some force on other bodies with which the former is compared, that by their giving way, that relation may be changed, in which the relative rest or motion of this other body did consist. Again, true motion suffers always some change from any force impressed upon the moving body, but relative motion does not necessarily undergo any change by such forces. For if the same forces are likewise impressed on those other bodies with which the comparison is made, that the relative position may be preserved. Then that condition will be preserved in which the relative motion consists. And therefore, any relative motion may be changed when the true motion remains unaltered, and the relative may be preserved when the true suffers some change. Thus, true motion by no means consists in any such relations. The effects which distinguish absolute from relative motion are the forces of receding from the axis of circular motion. For there are no such forces in a circular motion purely relative, but in a true and absolute circular motion, they are greater or less according to the quantity of the motion. If a vessel hung by a long cord is so often turned about that the cord is strongly twisted, then filled with water and held at rest together with the water, thereupon by the sudden action of another force it is whirled about the contrary way, and while the cord is untwisting itself, the vessel continues for some time in this motion, the surface of the water will at first be plain, as before the vessel began to move, but after that, the vessel, by gradually communicating its motion to the water, will make it begin sensibly to revolve, and recede by little and little from the middle, and ascend to the sides of the vessel, forming itself into a concave figure, as I have experienced, and the swifter the motion becomes, the higher will the water rise, till at last, performing its revolutions in the same times with the vessel, it becomes relatively at rest in it. This ascent of water shows its endeavour to recede from the axis of its motion, and the true and absolute circular motion of the water which is here directly contrary to the relative, becomes known, and may be measured by this endeavour. At first, when the relative motion of the water in the vessel was greatest, it produced no endeavour to recede from the axis. The water showed no tendency to the circumference, nor any ascent towards the sides of the vessel, but remained of a plain surface, and therefore its circular motion had not yet begun. 
but afterwards, when the relative motion of the water had decreased, the ascent thereof towards the sides of the vessel proved its endeavour to recede from the axis, and this endeavour showed the real circular motion of the water continually increasing, till it had acquired its greatest quantity when the water rested relatively in the vessel. And therefore this endeavour does not depend upon any translation of the water in respect of the ambient bodies, nor can true circular motion be defined by such translation. There is only one real circular motion of any one revolving body, corresponding to only one power of endeavouring to recede from its axis of motion, as its proper and adequate effect, but relative motions in one and the same body are innumerable, according to the various relations it bears to external bodies, and, like the other relations, are altogether destitute of any real effect, any otherwise than they may perhaps partake of that one only true motion. And therefore, in their system, who suppose that our heavens, revolving below the sphere of the fixed stars, carry the planets along with them, the several parts of those heavens and the planets which are indeed relatively at rest in their heavens do yet really move for they change their position one to another which never happens to bodies truly at rest and being carried together with their heavens partake of their motions and as parts of revolving holes endeavour to recede from the axis of their motions. Wherefore relative quantities are not the quantities themselves, whose names they bear, but those sensible measures of them, either accurate or inaccurate, which are commonly used instead of the measured quantities themselves. And if the meaning of words is to be determined by their use, then by their names, time, space, place and motion, their sensible measures are properly to be understood, and the expression will be unusual and purely mathematical if the measured quantities themselves are meant. On this account, those violate the accuracy of language which ought to be kept precise, who interpret these words for the measured quantities. Nor do those less defile the purity of mathematical and philosophical truths who confound real quantities with their relations and sensible measures. It is indeed a matter of great difficulty to discover and effectually to distinguish the true motions of particular bodies from the apparent, because the parts of that immovable space in which those motions are performed do by no means come under the observation of our senses. Yet the thing is not altogether desperate, for we have some arguments to guide us, partly from the apparent motions which are the differences of the true motions, partly from the forces, which are the causes and effects of the true motions. For instance, if two globes kept at a given distance, one from the other by means of a cord that connects them were revolved about their common center of gravity, we might, from the tension of the cord, discover the endeavor of the globes to recede from the axis of their motion and from thence we might compute the quantity of their circular motions. And then, if any equal forces should be impressed at once on the alternative faces of the globes to augment or diminish their circular motions, from the increase or decrease of that tension of the cord, we might infer the increment or decrement of their motions and thence would be found on what faces those forces ought to be impressed, that the motions of the globes might be most augmented, that is, we might discover their hindmost faces, or those which in the circular motion do follow. But the faces which follow being known, and consequently the opposite ones that proceed, we should likewise know the determination of their motions. And thus we might find both quantity and the determination of the circular motion 
even in an immense vacuum, where there was nothing external or sensible with which the globes could be compared. But now, if in that space some remote bodies were placed that kept always a given position one to another, as the fixed stars do in our regions, we could not indeed determine from the relative translation of the globes among those bodies whether the motion did belong to the globes or to the bodies. But if we observed the cord and found that its tension was that very tension which the motions of the globes required, we might conclude the motion to be in our globes and the bodies to be at rest. And then lastly, from the translation of the globes among the bodies, we should find the determination of their motions. But how we are to obtain the true motions from their causes, effects, and apparent differences, and the converse, shall be explained more at large in the following treatise. For to this end it was that I composed it. Axioms or Laws of Motion Law 1. Every body continues in its state of rest or of uniform motion in a right line unless it is compelled to change that state by forces impressed upon it. Projectiles continue in their motions so far as they are not retarded by the resistance of the air or impelled downwards by the force of gravity. A top whose parts by their cohesion are continually drawn aside from rectilinear motions does not cease its rotation, otherwise than as it is retarded by the air. The greater bodies of the planets and comets, meeting with less resistance in freer spaces, preserve their motions both progressive and circular for a much longer time. Law 2 the change of motion is proportional to the motive force impressed and is made in the direction of the right line in which that force is impressed. If any force generates a motion, a double force will generate double the motion, a triple force triple the motion, whether that force be impressed altogether and at once or gradually and successively. And this motion, being always directed the same way with the generating force, if the body move before, is added to or subtracted from the former motion, according as they directly conspire with or are directly contrary to each other, or obliquely joined when they are oblique so as to produce a new motion compounded from the determination of both. Law 3. To every action there is always opposed an equal reaction, or the mutual actions of two bodies upon each other are always equal and directed to contrary parts. Whatever draws or presses another is as much drawn or pressed by that other. If you press a stone with your finger, the finger is also pressed by the stone. If a horse draws a stone tied to a rope, the horse, if I may so say, will be equally drawn back towards the stone, for the distended rope, by the same endeavour to relax or unbend itself, will draw the horse as much towards the stone as it does the stone towards the horse, and will obstruct the progress of the one as much as it advances that of the other. If a body impinge upon another and by its force change the motion of the other, that body also, because of the equality of the mutual pressure, will undergo an equal change in its own motion towards the contrary part. The changes made by these actions are equal, not in the velocities, but in the motions of bodies. That is to say, if the bodies are not hindered by any other impediments. For, because the motions are equally changed, the changes of the velocities made towards the contrary parts are inversely proportional to the bodies. 
this law takes place also in attractions, as will be proved in the next scolium. Corollary 1. A body acted on by two forces simultaneously will describe the diagonal of a parallelogram in the same time as it would describe the sides by those forces separately. Corollary 2. And hence is explained the composition of any one direct force, AD, out of any two oblique forces, AC and CD, and on the contrary, the resolution of any one direct force, AD, into two oblique forces, AC and CD, which composition and resolution are abundantly confirmed from mechanics. Corollary 3. The quantity of motion which is obtained by taking the sum of motions directed towards the same parts and the difference of those that are directed to contrary parts suffers no change from the action of bodies amongst themselves. Corollary 4. The common centre of gravity of two or more bodies does not alter its state of motion or rest by the actions of the bodies among themselves, and therefore the common centre of gravity of all bodies acting upon each other, excluding external actions and impediments, is either at rest or moves uniformly in a right line. Corollary 5. The motions of bodies included in a given space are the same among themselves, whether that space is at rest or moves uniformly forwards in a right line without any circular motion. Corollary 6. If bodies moved in any matter among themselves, are urged in the direction of parallel lines by equal accelerative forces, they will all continue to move among themselves after the same manner as if they had not been urged by those forces. Scolium. Hitherto I have laid down such principles as have been received by mathematicians and are confirmed by abundance of experiments. By the first two laws and the first two corollaries, Galileo discovered that the descent of bodies varied as the square of the time, and that the motion of projectiles was in the curve of a parabola, experience agreeing with both, unless so far as these motions are a little retarded by the resistance of the air. When a body is falling, the uniform force of its gravity acting equally, impresses, in equal intervals of time, equal forces upon that body, and therefore generates equal velocities, and in the whole time impresses a whole force, and generates a whole velocity proportional to the time. And the spaces described in proportional times are as the product of the velocities and the times, that is, as the squares of the times. And when a body is thrown upwards, its uniform gravity impresses forces and reduces velocities proportional to the times. And the times of ascending to the greatest heights are as the velocities to be taken away. And those heights are as the product of the velocities and the times, or as the squares of the velocities. And if a body be projected in any direction, the motion arising from its projection is compounded with the motion arising from its gravity. Thus, if the body A, by its motion of projection alone, could describe in a given time the right line AB, and with its motion of falling alone, could describe in the same time the altitude AC, complete the parallelogram, 
A, B, C, D, and the body by that compounded motion will at the end of the time be found in the place D, and the curved line A, E, D, which that body describes, will be a parabola, to which the right line A, B will be tangent at A, and whose ordinate B, D will be as the square of the line A, B. On the same laws and corollaries depend those things which have been demonstrated concerning the times of the vibration of pendulums and are confirmed by the daily experiments of pendulum clocks. By the same, together with Law 3, Sir Christopher Wren, Dr. Wallace, and Mr. Huygens, the greatest geometers of our times, did severally determine the rules of the impact and reflection of hard bodies, and about the same time communicated their discoveries to the Royal Society, exactly agreeing among themselves as to those rules. Dr. Wallace, indeed, was somewhat earlier in the publication, then followed Sir Christopher Wren, and lastly, Mr. Huygens, but Sir Christopher Wren confirmed the truth of the thing before the Royal Society by the experiments on pendulums, which M. Mariette soon after thought fit to explain in a treatise entirely upon that, that subject. But to bring this experiment to an accurate agreement with the theory, we are to have due regard as well to the resistance of air as to the elastic force of the concurring bodies. Let the spherical bodies A, B, be suspended by the parallel and equal strings A, C, B, D from the centers C and D. About these centers, with those lengths as radii, describe the semicircles E, A, F, G, B, H bisected respectively by the radii CA, DB. Bring the body A to any point R of the arc EAF and, withdrawing the body B, let it go from thence and after one oscillation suppose it to return to the point V. Then RV will be the retardation arising from the resistance of the air. Of this RV, let ST be a fourth part situated in the middle, namely, so that RS is equal to TV, and RS to ST is equal to three to two. Then will ST represent very nearly the retardation during the descent from S to A. Restore the body B to its place, and supposing the body A to be let fall from the, from the point S, the velocity thereof in the place of reflection A, without sensible error, will be the same as if it had descended in vacuo from the point T upon which account this velocity may be represented by the chord of the arc TA, for it is a proposition well known to geometers that the velocity of a pendulous body in the lowest point is as the chord of the arc which it has described in its descent. After reflection, suppose the body A comes to the place S and the body B to the place K. Withdraw the body B and find the place V from which if the body A being let go should after one oscillation return to the place R. ST may be a fourth part of RV so placed in the middle thereof as to leave RS equal to TV and let the chord of the arc TA represent the velocity which the body A had in the place A immediately after reflection. For T will be the true and correct place to which the body A should have ascended if the resistance of the air had been taken off. In the same way we are to correct the place K to which the body B ascends 
by finding the place L to which it should have ascended in vacuo. And thus, everything may be subjected to experiment in the same manner as if we were really placed in vacuo. These things being done, we are to take the product, if I may so say, of the body A by the chord of the arc TA, which represents its velocity, that we may have its motion in the place A immediately before reflection, and then by the chord of the arc TA, that we may have its motion in the place A immediately after reflection. And so we are to take the product of the body B by the chord of the arc BL, that we may have the motion of the same immediately after reflection. And in like manner, when two bodies are let go together from different places, we are to find the motion of each as well before as after reflection. And then we may compare the motions between themselves and collect the effects of the reflection. Thus trying the thing with pendulums of 10 feet in unequal as well as equal bodies and making the bodies to concur after a descent through large spaces as of 8, 12 or 16 feet, I found always without an error of 3 inches that when the bodies concurred together directly, equal changes towards the contrary parts were produced in their motions and of consequence that the action and reaction were always equal as if the body A impinged upon the body B at rest with nine parts of motion and losing seven proceeded after reflection with two the body was carried backwards with those seven parts if the bodies concurred with contrary motions a with 12 parts of motion and B with 6. Then if A receded with 2, B receded with 8. Namely, with a deduction of 14 parts of motion on each side. Far from the motion of A subtracting 12 parts, nothing will remain. From subtracting 2 parts more, a motion will be generated of 2 parts towards the contrary way. And so, from the motion of body B of 6 parts, subtracting 14 parts, a motion is generated of 8 parts towards the contrary way. But if the bodies were made both to move towards the same way, A the swifter with 14 parts of motion, B the slower with 5, and after reflection A went on with 5, B likewise went on with 14 parts, 9 parts being transferred from A to B. And so in other case, by the meeting and collision of bodies, the quantity of motion obtained from the sum of the motions directed towards the same way or from the difference of those that were directed towards contrary ways was never changed. For the error of an inch or two in measures may be easily ascribed to the difficulty of executing everything with accuracy. It was not easy to let go the two pendulums so exactly that together that the bodies should impinge one upon the other in the lowermost place AB nor to mark the places S and K to which the bodies ascend after impact. Nay, and some errors too, might have happened from the unequal density of the parts of the pendulous bodies themselves and from the irregularity of the texture proceeding from other causes. But to prevent an objection that may perhaps be alleged against the rules for the proof of which this experiment was made, as if this rule did suppose that the bodies were either absolutely hard or at least perfectly elastic, whereas no such bodies are found in nature, I must add that the experiments we have been describing by no means depending upon that equality of hardness do succeed as well in soft as in hard bodies. 
For if the rule is to be tried in bodies not perfectly hard, we are only to diminish the reflection in such a certain proportion as the quantity of the elastic force requires. By the theory of Wren and Huygens, bodies absolutely hard return one from another with the same velocity with which they meet. But this may be affirmed with more certainty of bodies perfectly elastic. In bodies perfectly elastic, the velocity of the return is to be diminished together with the elastic force, because that force, except when the parts of bodies are bruised by their impact or suffer some such extension, as happens under the strokes of a hammer, is, as far as I can perceive, certain and determined and makes the bodies to return one from the other with a relative velocity, which is in a given ratio to the relative velocity which they met. This I tried in balls of wool, made up tightly and strongly compressed, for first by letting go the pendulous bodies and measuring their reflection, I determined the quantity of their elastic force and then, according to this force, estimated the reflections that ought to happen in other cases of impact. And with this computation, other experiments made afterwards did accordingly agree, the balls always receding one from the other with a relative velocity, which was to the relative velocity with which they met as about five to nine. Balls of steel returned with almost the same velocity, those of cork with a velocity something less, but in balls of glass the proportion was as about 15 to 16, and thus the third law, so far as it regards percussions and reflections, is proved by a theory exactly agreeing with experience. In attractions, I briefly demonstrate the thing after this manner. Suppose an obstacle is interposed to hinder the meeting of any two bodies A, B, attracting one the other. Then if either body, as A, is more attracted towards the other body B, than that body B is towards the first body A, the obstacle will be more strongly urged by the pressure of the body A than by the pressure of the body B, and therefore will not remain in equilibrium, but the stronger pressure will prevail and will make the system of the two bodies, together with the obstacle, to move directly towards the parts on which B lies, and in free spaces to go forwards in infinitum, with a motion continually accelerated, which is absurd and contrary to the first law. For by the first law, the system ought to continue in its state of rest, or of moving uniformly forwards in a right line, and therefore the bodies must equally press the obstacle, and be equally attracted one by the other. I made the experiment on the lodestone and iron. If these, placed apart in proper vessels, are made to float by one another in standing water, neither of them will propel the other. But by being equally attracted, they will sustain each other's pressure and rest at last in an equilibrium. So the gravitation between the earth and its parts is mutual. Let the earth, F, I, be cut by any plane, e.g. into two parts, e.g.f and e.g.i, and their weights one towards the other will be mutually equal. For if by another plane, h.k, parallel to the former e.q, the greater part, e.g.i, is cut into two parts, e.g.k, h and h.k.i whereof HKI is equal to the part EFG, first cut of. It is evident that the middle part, EGKH, will have no propension by its proper weight towards either side, but will hang as it were and rest in an equilibrium between both. But the one extreme part, HKI, 
will with its whole weight bear upon and press the middle part towards the other extreme part, EGF, and therefore the force with which EGI, the sum of the parts HKI and EGKH, tend towards the third part EGF, is equal to the weight of the part HKI, that is, to the weight of the third part EGF. And therefore the weights of the two parts EGI and EGF, one towards the other, are equal, as I was to prove. And indeed, if those weights were not equal, the whole earth floating in the non-resisting ether would give way to the greater weight, and, retiring from it, would be carried off in infinitum. And as those bodies are equipotent in the impact and reflection, whose velocities are inversely as their innate forces, so in the use of mechanic instruments, those agents are equipotent and mutually sustain each the contrary pressure of the other, whose velocities, estimated according to the determination of the forces, are inversely as the forces. So those weights are of equal force to move the arms of a balance, which during the play of the balance are inversely as their velocities upwards and downwards. That is, if the ascent or descent is direct, those weights are of equal force, which are inversely as the distances of the points at which they are suspended from the axis of the balance. But if they are turned aside by the interposition of oblique planes or other obstacles and made to ascend or descend obliquely, those bodies will be equipotent, which are inversely as the heights of their ascent and descent taken accordingly to the perpendicular, and that on account of the determination of gravity downwards. And in like manner in the pulley, or in a combination of pulleys, the force of a hand drawing the rope directly, which is to the weight, whether ascending directly or obliquely, as the velocity of the perpendicular ascent of the weight to the velocity of the hand that draws the rope, will sustain the weight. In clocks and such like instruments, made up from a combination of wheels, the contrary forces that promote and impede the motion of the wheels, if they are inversely as the velocities of the parts of the wheel on which they are impressed, will mutually sustain each other. The force of the screw to press a body is to the force of the hand that turns the handles by which it is moved as the circular velocity of the handle in that part where it is impelled by the hand is to the progressive velocity of the screw towards the pressed body. The forces by which the wedge presses or drives the two parts of the wood it cleaves are to the force of the mallet upon the wedge as the progress of the wedge in the direction of the force impressed upon it by the mallet is to the velocity with which the parts of the wood yield to the wedge in the direction of lines perpendicular to the sides of the wedge. And the like account is to be given of all machines. The power and use of machines consists only in this, that by diminishing the velocity, we may augment the force and the contrary from whence in all sorts of proper machines, we have the solution of this problem, to move a given weight with a given power or with a given force to overcome any other given resistance. For if machines are so contrived that the velocities of the agent and resistant are inversely as their forces, and that the agent will just sustain the resistance, but with a greater disparity of velocity will overcome it. So that if the disparity of velocities is so great as to overcome all that resistance which commonly arises either from the friction of contiguous bodies as they slide by one another or from the cohesion of continuous bodies 
that are to be separated or from the weights of bodies to be raised, the excess of the force remaining after all those resistances are overcome will produce an acceleration of motion proportional thereto, as well in the parts of the machine as in the resisting body. But to treat of mechanics is not my present business. I was aiming only to show by these examples the great extent and certainty of the third law of motion. For if we estimate the action of the agent from the product of its force and velocity, and likewise the reaction of the impediment from the product of the velocities of its several parts, and the forces of resisting arising from the friction, cohesion, weight, and acceleration of those parts, the action and reaction in the use of all sorts of machines will be found always equal to one another. And so far as the action is propagated by the intervening instruments, and at last impressed upon the resisting body, the ultimate action will always be contrary to the reaction.